He said, I'm getting away with murdering my wife. And he goes, oh no, I'm glad the is dead. And what about the nanny named Gypsy who entered the picture? It looks like you've come in to claim your prize. Gypsy Jillian Willis. Her name is Gypsy. Gypsy Jillian Willis. The Willis. person coming over's name was Gypsy. Gypsy. Tonight, the whole story. Grieving daughters forced to play detective against their own father. And I was just screaming, just screaming. Killed her. And the question that remains, was the nanny part of the whole scheme? When and she's she actually the girlfriend Gypsy. to the funeral. You crashed her funeral? I realize that looks, it looks pretty cold on the outside. Pretty cold? It looks callous. The Perfect Nanny. Here now, Elizabeth Vargas and David Muir. As we come on the air tonight, a doctor and husband sits behind bars waiting to learn just how long he'll be there for murdering his wife. A case that's now back in the headlines because tonight a key player is talking to Elizabeth. That's right, David. I've covered this story since it first began more than five years ago and one question kept coming back. How could such a picture-perfect marriage crumble so quickly, ending with pills and murder, and a healthy wife found dead in a bathtub? And did it have anything to do with the family's perfect nanny? Or was she? Michelle Summers was a fresh-faced beauty queen from California, a sometime model with a string of suitors. But it was a handsome aspiring doctor named Martin McNeil who made her fall hard and fast. They eloped when Michelle was 21 and soon afterward started a family. She had four kids in five years, so we were just mm -hmm. boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Alexis and Rachel McNeil grew up idolizing their father. We thought, what an inspiration to become a doctor, to become a lawyer. I wanted to, you know, follow in my father's footsteps. I always wanted to be a doctor, just like him. A doctor who didn't just help heal his patients, but who also taught Sunday school at their local Mormon church, and who seemed to have a heart big enough to adopt three young Ukrainian orphans, El, Giselle, and Sabrina. So from the outside looking in, it sounds like the perfect family. Yeah. If you're thinking it seems too good to be true, you're right. Take a closer look at the picture-perfect patriarch, and a different image begins to emerge. Not the typical father. He was just very, um, very haughty, stern, kind of haughty, arrogant. Mm -hmm. He thought anyone that was not at his educational stature was very beneath beneath him. He, he treated them very poorly. The only two things I want you to learn in school, number one, how to use the English language effectively. Number two, how to, how to effectively use money. When the family moved to the Utah community of Pleasant Grove, next door neighbors Doug and Christy Daniels couldn't help but notice the contrast between Martin and Michelle. She was very quiet, was always very pretty and very well kept. All the girls were just dressed perfect like a tea party. But the Daniels say Martin was a braggart and a bore. If Martin was ever around, it was him that, that always dominated every conversation. You could tell that he had a huge ego. He just made sure to say that he was downsizing into his home and that he was a doctor and a lawyer. Martin's adoring daughters often found themselves apologizing for their dad. Everybody hated him. Everyone hated him. I, mean, I, I was constantly trying to explain my father. When he'd come home, he's a completely different person. Mm -hmm. So we thought we knew the real person. It was when Martin turned 50, his daughters say, that the quirks they'd always defended turned stranger. He became obsessed with the way he looked. He started um, tanning a lot. You mean going to tanning salons? Tanning. tanning salons. He lost weight. He lost weight. He'd start exercising just all the time, just mm -hmm. in the middle of a conversation, jumping and doing push-ups, things like it was that. It's really bizarre. I mean, really very, strange. Very out of the ordinary. How did your mom react to all this behavior all of a sudden, this focus on physicality? She, she was suspicious. And even more suspicious as Alexis was when their father began disappearing for long stretches. This seemed less like a midlife crisis and more like an affair. When Alexis says Michelle confronted him about it, Martin made what seemed like the ultimate effort to change the topic. Newly fit and supremely tan, Martin told Michelle she should do some improving of her own. Your dad decided 
that your mom should get a facelift. Out of the blue. And my mom had never talked about that before or anything. She'd never been into plastic surgery. So how much convincing did it take for your mom to agree to this? Quite a bit, actually. She saw my dad tanning, getting all in shape. So I think, you know, my mom was just a little concerned too. Oh, well, maybe I should do a couple things, you know, maybe that will help. Wavering but wanting to keep her husband happy, Alexis says Michelle reluctantly agreed to the facelift. And my mom said, you know, Martin, let's just wait until the summer. I would be home from medical school for the, my summer break, and so I could help with the recovery. And my dad said, oh, no, Alexis, you have spring break coming up in a week. Let's do it then. In a week? My dad said, we have everything set up. You know, the anesthesiologist is reserved. We need to do it. April 3rd, 2007. Just two weeks after Alexis says her father first suggested it, Michelle undergoes a full facelift. Alexis says Martin insists the surgeon prescribe a powerful combination of painkillers and sedatives almost never taken to recover from this kind of procedure. And the surgeon agreed? He knew my dad was a physician, so he thought he knew how to, you know, dose different medications. It was just bizarre because, yeah, my mom was very sensitive to medication anyway. Alexis, away at medical school in Nevada, came home to care for her mother, but the evening after the surgery, she says her father abruptly told her to leave. He said, I, I need you to get some rest, Alexis. And I said, no, I want to stay right here by my mom. And he told me, I'll take care of her, her medicines tonight. You say that the next morning when you saw your mom, she was heavily medicated. She was completely sedated and out of it. The next day, I mean, it took a pretty much 24 hour period until she kind of regained consciousness and was able to talk to me. And she said, Alexis, you know, your dad, he just kept giving me medicines. And I went right to my dad and he goes, oh, well, oh, I don't know. I must have done something wrong. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, and your mother threw up. So then I gave her more medicine. I said, dad, don't give her any more medicine. I'm, I'm going to take over. Alexis spends the next four nights taking care of her mother and monitoring her medication. Michelle seems to be feeling better. But one morning, as Alexis was washing her mother's hair, she says Michelle dropped a bombshell. She started to cry. She said, if anything happens to me, make sure it wasn't your dad. And I said, Mom, what do you mean? You know, what are you saying? And she just said, you know, make sure if anything happens to me, it wasn't your dad. Alexis alone knows her mother's terrible secret fear, but Alexis would soon discover her father was keeping secrets too. Phone records revealed he was making calls at all hours of the day and night to the same number. Who was on the other end of the line? See what's next. The Perfect Nanny continues. Once again, Elizabeth Vargas. Michelle McNeil is recovering from a facelift her daughters say she had only to please her husband, Martin. Daughter Alexis gets ready to go back to medical school, still troubled by a strange warning she says her mother gave her about her father. But she is happy that Michelle appears to be on the mend. The doctor said she was healing great. She looked great. Went out to Sizzler. She had a, you know, a steak dinner. She was feeling great. They dropped me off at the airport. Um, you know, I just remember looking back and seeing my mom and waving. But the next morning, less than 24 hours later, there would be a 911 call from the McNeil home. Martin McNeil, a prominent local doctor, sounds frantic. She is unconscious. She's on the water. Okay, did you, did you get her out of the water? Veteran 911 dispatcher Heidi Johnson is on the line. It was really hard to understand him because he was yelling very hysterically at me. Okay, is she breathing at all? 
so I tried to calm him down and tried to get the information from him. Okay, do you know how to do CPR? I'm doing it. Okay, do not... But he didn't want to stay on the line with me and he hung up. In fact, Martin hangs up not once, but three times in less than five minutes. And he fails to give an audible address. As a result, Heidi Johnson loses precious minutes figuring out where to send the ambulance. Meanwhile, Martin sends the youngest McNeil child, six-year-old Ada, next door to neighbor Christy Daniels. And she said, um, my dad needs some help. It was Ada, just home from school, who first found Michelle unconscious in the bathtub. So I ran in and, you know, followed his voice into the bathroom and he says, I've already called 911. I need a male's help. A man's help to lift his dying wife from the tub? Crucial time passes as Martin sends Christy to call for her husband, Doug. And I just immediately went straight to her, her legs and grabbed her legs and Martin grabbed her, her upper body and we lifted her out of the tub and onto the floor. Doug says it is chaos in the bathroom with Martin veering from frantic attempts at CPR to fury. He would calmly be uh, doing puffs over there and then, and then he would suddenly have an outburst of of yelling, you know, why, why, uh, all for a stupid surgery. In the midst of it all, the phone rings. It is Alexis calling from medical school in Nevada. She is surprised when her father answers. He said, uh, your mom, she's in the tub. She's not breathing. I've called an ambulance. And then he hung up. For Alexis, in that moment, her mother's terrible secret fears begin to crystallize. I just dropped all my books and started driving to the airport and I was just screaming just screaming he killed her that was my first instinct he killed her before you left your mom said if anything happens to me make sure it wasn't your dad who killed me my dad had no idea that my mom had confided in me and I knew I was the only one that knew this so I needed to start figuring out what had happened and protect the rest of my family because my dad was a killer. Alexis's older sister Rachel has also been trying to call home and finally gets through to her father. I said, Dad, what's going on? Is it something with mom? And he said, Rachel, come home. And so I called Alexis and um, I said, Alexis, I know it. Mom's dead, isn't she? She's dead. And Alexis said, yes, yes. Stunned and grief-stricken, the two sisters return to their parents' home. Alexis takes Rachel aside. She walked with me into the closet and said, Rachel, Dad murdered Mom. I know, I know he did. I said, what are you talking about? I thought Alexis might have just been overly emotional over or just devastated. But soon, Rachel starts wondering. Her father's story of what happened doesn't seem to add up. Okay, do not hang. Why would this experienced doctor hang up repeatedly on the 911 operator? And why would a seemingly fit man need another man's help to rescue his dying wife? It was very strange to me that he couldn't lift my mother out of the tub because he was finishing the downstairs basement a few days prior and I had helped him lift sheetrock in. And Alexis had her own questions about Michelle's pills. She asks her father, where are those powerful painkillers and sedatives? And how many did her mother take on a morning when she had been recovering well from her facelift? I said, where's the medicine? And he said, um, I don't know, I don't know where it is. Check in the garage. But she finds no medications, and when she asks her father again, he says they've been thrown out. And why? It was making, it was making him too t- sad to look at, to see this medication. I mean, as soon as I heard that, things were just starting to add up. Everything was adding up. Mm-hmm. Now both sisters begin to suspect the inconceivable, because Alexis tells her sister about something else that happened just weeks before Michelle died. When her father had started to disappear for long stretches, Alexis says her mother asked her to do some late night investigating. While he was sleeping, I went online and printed out all of his phone records. And we found uh, this number um, that he'd been calling a lot. A number being dialed day and night. 
Alexis did an online search. And it popped out um, the name of the person. And, and it was? Gypsy Jillian Willis. And I was like, who's this? I mean, we thought it was maybe some like stripper or something. Who's named Gypsy? Who is Gypsy? Well, meet Gypsy Jillian Willis, a 30-year-old nursing student when she met Martin McNeil in an internet chat room. Her screen name, Phoenix Sheba. He told her his name was Joe. He sent me a message. He asked me what I knew about quantum physics. You bonded over quantum physics? There was just instant chemistry. He was tall, he was handsome, he was very well-spoken. Did you know he was married? I did. Yeah. And that didn't ring any alarm bells for you on the ethics front? Not at that point. I wasn't looking for a serious relationship, and he told me that he had a perfect life, that he had a perfect wife. A perfect wife and a suspicious death. Three days after Michelle was found dead in the bathtub, her grieving family attends her funeral. And standing in that crowd that day, Martin's lover, Gypsy. Why would you go to her funeral? Who invited you? I, no one invited me. I just found out where you it was. You crashed her funeral? <sighs> I, I had felt sorry that I had been involved with Martin inappropriately. I and felt you I that felt was sorry. the way to show that sorrow was to go to her funeral. No one knew who I was. Martin knew who you were. Martin knew who I was, and that's why I was there. I, I knew it would be a hard time for him. Gypsy isn't about to let Martin's mourning distract him. She sends Martin text messages in the middle of Michelle's funeral. She had even sent him semi-nude photos of herself the day after Michelle died. You did send him two suggestive pictures of your naked back. Why did you do that? Um, I wanted to keep his attention. It's, it's cold. It sounds heartless. I'm sorry. Um, but I, I knew that he would he would be having a hard time not thinking of, of me, and that was selfish. You understand that from the outside looking in, you're having an affair with this man, the wife inexplicably dies, you show up to her funeral, send him text messages during the funeral. It looks like you've come in to claim your prize. I did not look at it like that. But that's what it looked like to Martin's daughters when they made another startling discovery. And we'd come to find out that my dad had been dating Gypsy for several years before my mom's death. Less than a month after his wife dies, Martin McNeil moves Gypsy into the house to care for his motherless children. So were you the nanny or were you the girlfriend? So what do you think of Gypsy? And if you had the chance to interview her, what questions would you ask? Tweet me using hashtag ABC2020. We'll be right back. Still to come, how did Martin McNeil's fairy tale marriage end up in a bathtub with a 911 call and his wife lying face down? Or was she? This bathtub, ladies and gentlemen, has an important story to tell. The Perfect Nanny continues next. <music> 2020 continues with The Perfect Nanny. In the hours after Michelle McNeil's death, Pleasant Grove police detectives see no reason to treat the bathroom where she died like a crime scene. They collect no evidence from the McNeil house. And the only person they interview is her husband, Martin, who they know is a well-established local doctor. He tells them he believes his wife passed out while preparing the tub. I thought that if this is a, a healthy woman that died that there would be some sort of big police investigation. Their police report onto my mother's death is about two and a half paragraphs. The medical examiner determines that hypertension and an existing heart infection called myocarditis caused Michelle's heart to fail. In other words, death by natural causes. Natural causes? She's not an old woman. She's no. She just turned 50 years old. I mean, she, she had a few issues. She had a little bit of high cholesterol, some high, high blood pressure. Police close the case. Alexis and Rachel are stunned. But their father is moving on. And quickly, he arranges a funeral within three days and just two days after is back at work. And even though Alexis and Rachel say they have offered to come home to care for the four younger McNeil children, their father announces he will hire a nanny. And he already seems to have one in mind. And he said, oh, I found the perfect nanny. 
And I said, what's her name? And he said, oh, I think it's Jillian. I said, Dad, Gypsy Jillian Willis. I said, I know that woman. I know Mom was worried you were having an affair with her, and you were not to bring her in the home. But Martin would not be deterred. He calls a family meeting. And he said, there is going to be uh, an interview for a nanny. And there was only one candidate, and that was Gypsy. Gypsy. Imagine that. Yeah. And she got the job. She didn't cook. She didn't clean. She didn't take care of the children in any way. Why did you move into the home? Martin told me that he needed help with his younger children. Were you still sleeping with him? I was. So were you the nanny or were you the girlfriend? I moved in to help with the kids. I, when we, when we had opportunity, I still slept with him. So you were both? If you want to look at it like that. But Martin's daughters didn't like the look of that one bit. She walked into the house like she owned the place. And then when I questioned my dad and said, what's going on? He said, oh, she's a guest in our home. And how dare you question me? He said, if you fight me, I'm going to get you thrown out of medical school. And he started threatening me, I'm going to take you down. I was told that I needed to leave the home because I, I wasn't nice to Gypsy. He wanted to make it known that it was either Gypsy or his children. And he chose the nanny. Yeah. The nanny. Three months after moving into the McNeil home, Gypsy took Martin back to Wyoming to meet her parents, Harold and Vicki Willis. He said, I never loved Michelle, but I love Gypsy. And I said, but you had a family with Michelle. He says, actually, I loved her as a friend. I loved her as a sister, but I never loved her like I loved Gypsy. During that trip, Martin proposed to Gypsy in front of her family. Gypsy's sister, Julie, was there. He gave this grand speech about how he loved her and how he loved her from the moment he saw her. And he knelt and proposed to her and Gypsy cried. It was very fairy tale. This was the man who'd been telling you just a couple months earlier that he had the perfect life and the perfect wife. Yeah. So you must have been shocked when three months after she died, he proposed marriage to you. I wasn't shocked. I, I, it just, like I said, it seemed very natural. It seemed like a natural progression. I, I believe he loved his wife. He did sincerely mourn Michelle, but she was gone. And I, I, didn't, I didn't suspect anything unusual. So you're saying he never told you, I wish I wasn't married to Michelle. He never said that. I wish Michelle was dead. No, he never said that. I'd rather be with you and not Michelle. He didn't say that. Martin didn't say he'd rather be with Gypsy, but was he thinking it? And what was she thinking? Don't you think it's a little funny that he goes from saying, I love Michelle, to, oops, she died, move in, let's continue sleeping together while you take care of my kids, and will you marry me? I realize that looks, it looks pretty cold on the outside. Cold. Gypsy's own sister, Julie, goes even further. I would consider Gypsy to be a deceptive, malevolent, malicious, calculating person. Calculating and violent. It wasn't right. Julie says Gypsy had feuded with her and other family members for years. And even Gypsy admits to having a fist fight with her mother over ownership of a dog, the last time she ever saw her family. I was bruised from head to toe. I had a sprained knee. I had choke marks around my neck. She lunged forward and she bit me on my upper left bicep. A bad bite. You could count every single tooth mark. She doesn't care who gets hurt. She doesn't care what circumstances are ruined. Fist fighting is one thing, but could Gypsy have gone so far as to help Martin kill Michelle? If she sees something she wants, she will rationalize it to herself to the point where she will get that. And it doesn't matter who stands in her way. Those are your family. I know. They think that you're capable of murder. They are horrible and they are hateful. It is appalling that my family would say such things. And I think it is completely un unfounded and unjust. In this family feud, is Gypsy sistered embittered or the person who knows Gypsy best? Julie Willis says Gypsy found the perfect match in Martin McNeil. In a bad way, they were perfect for each other. Together, I believe that they are perfectly capable of killing Michelle. They're like a pack of dogs. One dog alone might be malicious, might take a nip out of things, but two dogs together hunting are lethal. Stay with us. Once again, Elizabeth Vargas.
Four years ago, two desperate sisters took their story to 2020 after a small town police department closes the case on their mother's death in the family bathtub and let their father, Martin McNeil, off scot free. Not only did, would they not listen, they were mocking us. They were saying, you're ridiculous. You guys are just upset that, you know, your dad has had an affair. Lots of people have affairs. But they found a sympathetic ear in Doug Whitney, an investigator at the Utah County Attorney's Office. Two years after Michelle's death, they convince him to reopen the case. And when he does, he finds something surprising. Martin was not the man he claimed to be. This prominent doctor and lawyer actually had a life based on three decades of lies, stretching all the way back to his days in college and his school transcript. His entire career is based on falsified transcripts from different colleges. Well, so then how did he go about practicing medicine? The guy is brilliant. I'm not saying that he's, that he's not smart. He just... Didn't take the necessary classes. And, and he lies. And that was only the beginning of his lies. The summer after Michelle's death, Martin stole his 14-year-old adopted daughter Giselle's identity. He applied for a new social security card using Giselle's personal information and Gypsy's name. They went into court and changed the birth date, 20 years. That's called perjury. Now there's two people with that social security number. There's two people with that name. And that new false social security card number was only the beginning. How did this idea come up to take Giselle's identity, her social security number, her passport, and adopt it as yours? When I uh, got together with Martin, I had a, a lot of tax debt, um, probably in the range of fifty or sixty thousand dollars. This was Martin. This is Martin's idea. This was Martin's activity. Why I, did you do it? I said I didn't want to. I, he said that this is the best way to do it. It's temporary. It's not going to hurt anybody. No one will notice. But someone did notice, namely Doug Whitney, when he starts looking closely at Michelle's death. He discovers that Martin and Gypsy are amassing fake IDs all over Utah. You're talking about a state ID card, you're talking about bank accounts that were opened up under false names. Martin did a lot of things that were um, not very sensible. So you're saying Martin did all of this without your knowledge? He would tell me he was doing things and I'd be like, okay, whatever. You got two fake military ID cards three joint banking accounts using a fake name, you got a fake birth certificate, a fake Utah state ID card, and a fake social security card. And you're saying all you did was sort of sign away and not ever ask or wonder how many laws I've broken? How could you be a passive participant in that? Martin was very powerful. He was very influential. I just assumed that he knew what he was doing. He had been successful all of his life. You know, Gypsy, you're an educated person. You bonded over quantum physics. And now you want me and us and authorities to believe that you just checked your, your brain at the door and agreed to all this? When you love someone, you do things that don't make a lot of sense. He had everyone confused. He was this pillar of the community. He'd been bishop twice. I mean, he, he had all of the accoutrements to be convincing. Martin McNeil's gigantic con job was stopped short by Doug Whitney's investigation. He had both Martin and Gypsy arrested for identity theft, and they were convicted in federal court and sent to prisons in Texas. And while they are behind bars, investigators go for broke and work to pin Michelle's death on Martin. I will simply say that I believe that Mark McNeil is a sociopath. They begin chipping away at Martin's version of the story of his wife's final bath and ask some tough questions. Why couldn't a fitness addict like Martin lift his wife out of the bathtub alone? Could Martin's relationship with Gypsy be a motive for murder? The questions raise suspicions, but it's still not enough to charge Martin with murder. Then the prosecutors catch a break. Something happens in prison that lands McNeil in hot water. And weeks after his release from prison on the fraud charge, he is arrested again, this time for murder. There is a big trial getting underway in Utah. There was no doubt in my mind that one day this case was going to be reopened. Five and a half years after Michelle died, Martin McNeil sat once again before a judge, this time fighting for his life. This case is a puzzle with many pieces. 
The trial opens with McNeil's defense attorneys claiming Michelle died of natural causes. What is very important in this case is that none of the medical examiners believe that Michelle's death was due to a homicide. The jury of five men and three women was about to hear Martin's sordid secrets when witnesses reveal how he really felt about Michelle. And he goes, I'm not I'm glad the is dead. Next. Twenty twenties, the perfect nanny continues. Once more, Elizabeth Vargas. Taking center stage, a model of a bathtub. It was called the case of the murder in the bathtub, gripping the country for weeks. She finds her mom dead in the tub. Martin McNeil on trial for his wife's murder. Let me just say, may they rot in hell. Martin McNeil sat in a Utah courtroom charged with the premeditated murder of his wife and the mother of their eight children. His chief accusers, his own grown daughters who believe their dad was a killer. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury. But Martin's defense team tries to discredit the daughter's version of events, sticking to the coroner's original report that Michelle's death was from natural causes. Martin McNeil is innocent, ladies and gentlemen. The trial begins with Michelle's cosmetic surgeon, Dr. Scott Thompson. Good morning, Dr. Thompson. Good morning. He runs through the laundry list of drugs he prescribed for Michelle following her routine facelift surgery. Keflex, Phenergan, Valium is the anxiety medication, Percocet, Ambien for the sleeping, erythromycin eye ointment, the Medrol dose pack, the hydrocodone elixir, liquid medication for pain. Thompson admits he wouldn't normally prescribe so many drugs, but that Martin, a fellow doctor, assured him that he wouldn't let Michelle take too many pills. Why did you prescribe it here? Uh, because Martin was a physician and he asked me for these things. Was it your intention that Michelle take all these drugs together? No. Would you have prescribed this combination to her if Martin was not a physician? No. On the stand, Martin's daughter Alexis testifies that Martin forced Michelle to take more drugs than she wanted. She said, Lexi, I don't, I don't know why, but your dad kept giving me medication. He kept giving me things, telling me to swallow. And she said, I even started to throw up, but then he started giving me more medication. Did she make any specific requests? She actually had me take out every single pill from the pill bottles, and she wanted to feel what the pills fe felt like in her in her fingers um, so that if my dad tried to give her anything she'd know what he was giving her because at that time she couldn't see but the jury would not hear a crucial piece of evidence something that Alexis revealed to 2020 about Michelle's fears just days before her death she said if anything happens to me make sure it wasn't your dad those damning words are ruled too prejudicial by the judge. The jury never hears them. So the prosecution instead hones in on Martin's movements the morning Michelle died. There's about an hour and a half period of time where no one really knows where Martin is. A timeline shows a 90-minute gap between the time Martin left work and when he picked up six-year-old Ada from school. Plenty of time. Rush home, take care of your business, give Michelle the drugs, fix her up a bath, get her in the tub, hold her head down for a little while, and help her out. Witnesses say Martin was frantic that day. I could hear Martin yelling that he needed help. I asked him what happened. And what did he tell you? He said, well, he went in into the room and uh, could, he described it as he, he saw her face down the wrong way in the tub. As a crucial centerpiece of their case, prosecutors haul in a replica of the bathtub where Michelle was found. This bathtub, ladies and gentlemen, has an important story to tell, okay? Witnesses reenact what they saw. Neighbor Christy Daniels testifies that when she entered the bathroom, she saw Michelle facing up and lying inside the bathtub, partially undressed. That contradicts Martin's description of the scene. Was Michelle dressed or not? What I remember is Michelle had a long black sleeve shirt on and nothing else. Okay, N um, no bottoms. No bottoms. 
Prosecutors argue that Martin tried to make it look as though Michelle had been taking a bath and that she slipped under the water. But he had been interrupted when the neighbors arrived sooner than he expected. It's a very small bathtub. It'd be almost impossible in this bath to, to slip under the water. So why would Martin try to stage a drowning accident? Prosecutors argue it all comes back to Gypsy. He was at a crossroads. He had to choose between Michelle and Gypsy. He chose Gypsy. He chose Gypsy over Michelle. And although it is Martin McNeil who was on trial for murder, it seems as though everyone has something to say about Gypsy. It's Gypsy Jillian Willis. Her name is Gypsy. Gypsy Jillian the Willis. The person coming over's name was Gypsy. Gypsy Jillian Willis. The jury hears how Martin lied to his children, telling them Gypsy was just the nanny. Because she was nothing like my mom. Did you ever see your dad and Jillian interact? Yes. What did you see? Um, I remember her going up into my dad's room at night and then have the door closed and I just remember stay I remember staying up at night thinking what in the, what in the world I mean I thought she was our nanny why is she up in dad's room the testimony of his children may have been devastating to Martin McNeil but what may have sealed his fate was a string of inmates from his time in prison while serving two years for identity fraud did Martin talk to you at all about the relationship he had with his wife before she died? A little bit, yes. Do you recall what he said? That she was not going to let him keep cheating on her. Did he say whether he actually was cheating on her? Oh, yeah. He told me about his girlfriend. Did he tell you what his girlfriend's name was? I don't remember. I don't recall. Her name was Dipsy or Gypsy or something like that. Some of the inmates request that their identity be concealed for fear of reprisal in prison for snitching. Doc, they say you are... Uh, murdered your wife and he's like I, I can get away with a lot of things did he say anything else about that yeah he's getting away with the murder of his wife he called her a and i just went up to him and said hey man i apologize about your wife and he goes i'm not i'm glad the is dead okay the prosecution rests its case and the defense calls a handful of character witnesses and a medical examiner to drive home its main argument that there is no proof that michelle is a murder victim is there a real possibility that the inmates are not telling the truth? Yes, there is. Defense lawyers continue to cling to the original autopsy report, citing a natural death. They don't rise to the level of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. The jury doesn't buy it. Has the jury reached a verdict? After three weeks of testimony and 11 hours of deliberation, the jury returns a verdict. Martin is stone-faced, listening as it's read. As to count one, murder, guilty. <laughs> guilty of first-degree murder. It was such, such a relief. Um, been fighting for this for so long. And I never thought we'd, we'd come to this day. I never thought it would make it to even trial. And then to be in that courtroom and hear guilty, um, just was a flood of emotions. Alexis's father will likely be in prison for the rest of his life. And the woman at the center of the storm, Martin's mistress, Gypsy, she has an alibi for where she was the day Michelle died, and she was never charged with anything related to her death. But Alexis is not convinced. I do believe that, that Gypsy uh, was involved with my mother's death. Uh, she was the motive. and.